on the day. Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. It is Saturday, February 13th, 2022. And we are almost in the middle, right at, right at the point in the middle of African American History Month. So I teach an online class on uh, Sundays um, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. And I teach this class on Sundays, 2 p.m. to uh, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I'm going to do a quick uh, preview of uh, some of the content in this online class. And we go through and we start history uh, looking in, uh, looking at the uh, Louisiana Purchase in 1803. And we go through history to uh, see what happened uh, during the Civil War. Uh, Reconstruction, um, Jim Crow era, Great Migration, World War One, World War Two, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement. Okay, and this class is a continuation of another class that I teach: um, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Maafa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. So uh, I teach this class uh, on on Sundays, and I'll be teaching it today, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, so if you haven't registered for this class, you can register for it now. OK, uh, so this class uh, evolved out of the uh, other class that I teach, H.N. Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade. And I've been teaching that class since uh, 2017. OK, on and off since 2017. So some of the things we deal with in the class uh, to even understand the. Uh, Civil War, you have to, it, it starts April 12, 1861, you have to look at events that lead up to the Civil War taking place. So we start with the Louisiana Purchase of 1803, okay? And this class pretty much picks up where um, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, uh, uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade uh, leaves off, okay? If you um, haven't registered for any of these classes, you can do so. We'll post the information here, but you can do so at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, uh, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can register there uh, for the online classes, and uh, we'll give you some more information for that also, okay? All right, and let me uh, show you the website here quickly here, and then we'll jump into this uh, brief history lesson. So... Uh, at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, scroll down. We have the information here from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Click right here to register here. You can register for the class. This is the other class that I teach on Saturdays, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade. Both classes are on sale, $80 each, regularly $130. We do have a bundle pack. You can register for both classes for only $120, so click right there and register there. And if you've taken any of my online classes before, even going back to 2017, email me at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com and we'll give you 50% off, 50% discount. Okay, so oftentimes when we learn about the Louisiana Purchase in school, they don't talk about the connection between the Louisiana Purchase and the Haitian Revolution of 1791 to 1804. And uh, one of the reasons why France sold the, 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 the territory here in the land we call the U.S., the Louisiana Territory, uh, 828,000 square miles of, of land the U.S. got for less than three cents an acre. They got for about $15 million. Thomas Jefferson was the one who signed off on the Louisiana Purchase. One of the reasons why France sold that land is because they were getting their behinds kicked by the Haitians, and they were almost going bankrupt. Now, the Louisiana Purchase of 1803 brought into the uh, uh, brought into the United States about 828,000 square miles of territory from France, thereby doubling the size of the Young Republic. The, the U.S. doubles the, the size of their territory, okay, and this gives uh, more land for the U.S. to grow crops on. And what this does is this increases the need for uh, enslaved African uh, labor here in the U.S., what was known at the time as the Louisiana Territory stretched from the Mississippi River uh, in the east to the Rocky Mountains in the west and from the Gulf of Mexico in the south to the Canadian border in the north. Part or all 
of 15 states were eventually created from the land deal, which is considered one of the most important achievements of Thomas Jefferson's presidency. OK, so and because of things like the uh, cotton gin uh, created in 1793 and copies of the cotton gin, what this is going to do is this is going to uh, reduce the uh, cost of producing cotton. OK, and then that's going to also increase the need for uh, more African slaves as well. All right. Now, here's a. Uh, Here's a, a map showing the Louisiana Territory. You see it looks like right in the middle of the U.S. Louisiana Territory, 1803. We see the Mississippi uh, uh, to the east of that. And then we see the uh, Oregon Territory uh, also over in the west. Um, and we see uh, that territory below, below that, it, this light orange is Spanish Territory at this time, 1803. And what we do, each class, we go through and analyze approximately a 10, 15, 20 year period of history. We go through, look at a timeline of history, uh, the numerous articles, book references, video clips that we look at to get a better understanding of the chronology of this history. Historical events don't happen in a vacuum. They are the culmination of a sequence of historical events that lead to larger events taking place. So to better understand where we are today, how we got to where we are today, the laws and policies put in place, to put us in the predicament we're in today, we have to understand this history, and this helps us better understand where we need to go from here, okay? What needs to happen after this? The whole fight over the, uh, the these, these anti-critical race theory laws being passed, uh, 14 different states have passed these laws so far. Uh, the attack, uh, the 400-plus uh, voter suppression bills that are in state legislatures right now, uh, 19 states have passed about 34 voter suppression bills. That is a continuation of what happened during the Jim Crow era. Uh, and we look at 1889, 1890, like Mississippi passing, uh, uh, rewriting their state constitution, imposing poll taxes and literacy tests, and many of the southern states copying this after 1890. South Carolina, 1895, Alabama, 1898, Louisiana, in, sorry, Louisiana, 1898, Alabama, 1901, Oklahoma, things like this. We're going to see this continuation taking place. So we, we could draw a direct parallel between what happened during the Jim Crow era, reversing the advancements African Americans have been making uh, after Reconstruction ends in 1877, and we could draw a direct parallel to what's going on right now in these attacks Republicans are making, but not just on African Americans, on Latinos, Asian Americans, etc. How's everybody doing? All right, thanks for joining us. How's everybody doing? Can you hear me okay? Let me know. All right, so let's continue. Um, so we start out talking about the Louisiana, Louisiana Purchase in this 10-week online course that I teach. Then we look at things like, uh, we look at the Mexican-American War, 1846-1848. Uh, we look at the, uh, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which ends the Mexican-American War. And the U.S. is going to get the territory that makes up California, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, and Nevada. Okay, that's something we're going to talk about in today's class, the Mexican-American War, which is not talked about very much, but it's crucial to understanding history, but also understanding tensions between the U.S. and Mexico as well. OK, and we know that Mexico wins its independence from Spain in 1821. Texas wins it, it, Texas will win its independence from Mexico in 1836. Texas comes into the U.S. as a slave holding state in 1845. And we know that the Texas Rangers that are the state police in Texas, we know the Texas Rangers, not the baseball team, but the state police, the Texas Rangers get their start in 1836 as bounty hunters hired by slave owners in Texas to go into Mexico to capture runaway slaves and bring them back into Texas. But you but you also want to have runaway slaves who run away from from surrounding uh, territories, surrounding states in Texas, uh, surrounding states around Texas, because Mexico uh, was free territory. Mexico abolished slavery in 1829 when Vicente Guerrero, who was of African descent and the second president of Mexico, when he becomes president, he abolishes slavery in Mexico. OK, so you're going to have a underground railroad going south into Mexico as well. 
So the U.S. Civil War, 1861-1865, starts April 12, uh, 1861, after Abraham Lincoln becomes president-elect in the November 1860 presidential election. The Republican Party is a newly formed party founded in 1854 as a direct backlash to the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, and we break all this down in the class. Um, and the South thinks Lincoln's going to free the slaves. Um, South Carolina is the first state to secede from the Union, December 20th, 1860. They're going to be followed by a number of states as well uh, going into uh, 1861. Now, the Civil War in the United States began in 1861, April 12th, with the attack on Fort Sumter in South Carolina. After decades of simmering tensions between northern and southern states over slavery, states' rights, and westward expansion, westward expansion. The election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860 caused seven southern states to secede and form the Confederate States of America, the CSA, the Confederate States of America. Four more states soon joined them. The war between the states as the Civil War was also known ended, um, was also known ended in Confederate surrender in 1865. OK, uh, the conflict was the costliest and deadliest war ever fought on American soil with some 620,000 of 2.4 million soldiers killed, millions more injured and much of the South left in ruin. OK, History dot com has a good uh, piece dealing with uh, American Civil War. History dot com is the official website of the History Channel. OK. And anytime I teach, I know I may say some things that outside the circumference of some people's awareness or just because you've never heard it before, disagree with it or don't like it does not mean it's not true. It just means you have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about. All right. Now we look at the Reconstruction era as well. Now, the Reconstruction era is something is is critical to understand this piece of history is not taught correctly in schools just like the history of slavery is not taught correctly in schools and one of the things that uh one of the tools that i use in the class is is this study here from the southern poverty law center teaching hard history american slavery teaching hard history american slavery and what this uh study does is about a 52 uh about a 52 page study or so and this came out in uh i think it was 2018 february 2018 but this study documents how the history of slavery is being incorrectly taught in schools all across the country. And it, it makes numerous recommend, recommendations to more correctly teach the history of slavery. And one of the things, they did a survey of 1,000 high school seniors, and they found that only 8%, only 8% of high school seniors surveyed could identify slavery as the central cause of the Civil War. Only 8%, not 80 Eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Two thirds or 68 percent of high school seniors surveyed, and they surveyed 1,000 high school seniors, did not know that it took a constitutional amendment to formally end slavery. It's the 13th Amendment ratified December 6, 1865, when Georgia ratified the 13th Amendment. Most of, the, most of them thought it was the Emancipation Proclamation of January 1st, 1863, which we break down in the class and we deal with why the Emancipation Proclamation did not free the slaves. Okay, this is why you have to read it. You can go to LOC.gov, which is Library of Congress website, or archives.gov, National Archives, and read all these documents, U.S. Constitution, Emancipation Proclamation, Declaration of Independence. Because when you actually read these documents, you get a much better understanding of them. Now, um, if we look at this piece here, this article here from uh, Time Magazine, it talks about how the history of Reconstruction is not being taught in schools largely across the country. Now, this article from Time Magazine is from um, an office subscription at Time. I have to remember what my login is so I can log in because I pay Time Magazine each each month. January 12, 2022. A new report finds that 45 states out of 50, a new report finds that 45 states are failing to teach students about the period that shaped race relations after the Civil War. That's Reconstruction, 1865 to 1877. And Reconstruction ends in 1877. 
And then after that, you're going to see a reversal of the a lot of the advancements and achievements African-Americans were making. The new report finds that 45 states are failing to teach students about the period that shaped race relations after the Civil War. And very briefly here in the article from Olivia B. Waxman, it says in the aftermath of the insurrection, January 6, 2021, which is a continuation of the Civil War. OK, and a continuation of, of what happened after Reconstruction ends in the attack on African-Americans during the Jim Crow era. In the aftermath of the insurrection a year ago at the U.S. Capitol, many leading historians, many, many leading historians drew parallels between the violence and the Reconstruction era, drew parallels between the violence and the Reconstruction era. The period of the political revolution directly following the U.S. Civil War, the American Civil War. Eric Foner, Pulitzer Prize winning historian and author of Reconstruction, America's Unfinished Revolution, 1863 to 1877, said in an interview with The New Yorker, published a week after the uh, January 6th insurrection, quote, the events we saw reminded me very much of the Reconstruction era and the overthrow of Reconstruction, which ends with the Compromise of 1877, when Rutherford B. Hayes, the Republican candidate for president, becomes president. It is the backdoor agreement between Republicans and Democrats to let Rutherford B. Hayes become president. And if the Democrats are allowed to do that, if they allow that to happen, then he will remove the remaining uh, Union troops out of the South, okay, which will allow the Demo Democrats, the white supremacists, to take back full control of the, of the states and the state, uh, the state legislatures and the politics in the states. OK, and this is what happened. And we break this. I break this down in the class. The events we saw reminded me very much of the Reconstruction era and the overthrow of Reconstruction, which was often accompanied or accomplished, I should say, by violent assaults on elected officials, by violent assaults on elected officials, which is why the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871 was passed by Congress in an October of 1871. President Ulysses S. Grant used the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871, which is the third of the four force acts during the Reconstruction era. He used that to declare martial law in nine counties in South Carolina because they were attacking and beating up and killing um, African-American elected officials, but also white Republican elected officials as well. So this is that we can draw direct parallels between the January 6th insurrection and the Reconstruction era. OK, scholars say studying the aftermath of the Civil War can put in context many of the most seminal events in the U.S. in recent years from the brutal murder of George Floyd by uh, police in 2020 in Minneapolis, Minnesota, Derek Chauvin to the voter suppression laws enacted after African-American voters played a big role in helping Joe Biden and VP Kamala Harris become elected in 2020. But despite the timeliness of, uh, but despite the timeliness of the era in today's climate, many students in American schools will not get a full education on reconstruction until they go to college. Okay, well, one, most of them are not the majority. I'm not saying they're not qualified to go to college, but the majority of American children in school today, high school, middle school, the majority probably won't go to college. Okay, they may go to trade school, something else, go into the military, but the majority won't go to college. But even in college, because I remember, um, you know, in college, I didn't get a lot of uh, education on Reconstruction, not until really I took Africana Studies classes. But hell, that was in, you know, when I was about to graduate. And that wasn't that wasn't even that wasn't even a requirement. I took those on my own because I was already studying African history. OK. All right. So check out this. Uh, check out this article here from Time magazine. A new report finds that 45 states are failing to teach students about the period that shaped race relations after the Civil War. And we're still dealing with the, the effects of um, Reconstruction 
uh, ending in 1877, the, uh, the, the, the Freedmen's Bank uh, failing in 1874, the U.S. Bureau of Freedmen Refugee, Refugees in Abandoned Lands, the Freedmen's Bureau shutting down in 1872. We're still dealing with the side effects of all of that. So when we look at the Reconstruction era, how's everybody doing today? Okay, I'm doing a, a Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, writer, and historian. I'm doing a brief overview of a 10-week online class that I teach um, called From the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968, okay? So I teach this class on Sundays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, you can register for the class here. It's on sale, $80, regularly $130. As soon as you register, you can watch uh, the class we did last week also. And there's bonus content for you as well. You're going to get some bonus lectures from me uh, also in this in this package. All right. And uh, we also you can we also have a course bundle. We can register for this class and ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, which is a class uh, I teach on Saturdays. And we deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Uh, I teach that class on Saturdays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, we have a bundle pack. You can register for both classes for only $120. Uh, they're regularly $130 each. And we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. And you can go back and watch them anytime. So two years from now, if you want to go back and watch these full the classes in full, you can do that. You'll still have access. Okay, so that's at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. If you've taken any of my online classes that I've taught in the past, and I've been teaching these classes since 2017. If you're taking any of them, email me at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com, ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com. You're going to get a 50% discount on these courses. And these classes, I would say, are PG-13, so you can use these with your children also, okay? Because a lot of times people are looking for references they can use with children. You can use this with your children also. And they're, they're, uh, the information is very well documented. They give you numerous sources, articles, book references, uh, books, etc. You don't have to buy any of these books to follow along in class or take the class. You don't have to feel obligated to buy any of these books. You can if you want to, but you don't have to. Reconstruction era, 1865 to 1877. For a 14 year period, the U.S. government took steps to try and integrate the nation's newly freed black people, newly, newly freed African-Americans, uh, newly freed African-American population into society. Between 1863 and 1877, the U.S. government undertook the task of integrating nearly four million formerly enslaved African people into society after the Civil War bitterly divided the country over the issue of slavery. A white slave holding South that had built its economy, a white slave holding South that had built its economy and culture on slave labor was now forced by its defeat in a war that claimed 620,000 lives to change its economic, political, and social relations with African Americans. And they, and they didn't do it willingly, okay? They didn't do it willingly at all. Uh, we look at the Mexican American War, 1846 to 1848, which is very, is, the Mexican, Mexican American War is not really talked about a lot but it's really crucial to understanding history today especially the treaty of guadalupe hidalgo of 1848 and what the u.s gained uh from this treaty and the u.s w really wanted to take over the entire north american continent you had this concept of manifest destiny in 1845 uh coined by john l uh, sullivan and you have uh westward expansion taking place uh by the united states and Mexico was part of North America, so this so this is causing conflicts. Uh, the Mexican-American War, also called Mexican War, Spanish Guerrero, uh, uh, Guerrero Day, 1847, um, or War of the United States against Mexico. This war between the United States and Mexico, April 1846 to February 1848, stemming from the United States annexation of Texas in 1845, and from a dispute over whether Texas ended at the uh, uh, Nueces River, okay, which the Mexicans claimed it did, or the Rio Grande, which the U.S. claimed it did. It was, a, it was over a border dispute, 
It's over the, a border dispute, okay, that leads to the Mexican-American War taking place. The war in which U.S. forces were consistently victorious resulted in the United States acquisition of more than 500,000 square miles of land of Mexican territory extending westward from the Rio Grande to the Pacific Ocean. So the U.S. is going to get um, out of this war it, it, because of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. The U.S. is going to get the land that makes up California, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, and Nevada. They get all that land from uh, Mexico. They get it for about $15 million. And then in 1849, then you have the gold rush in uh, California. And you're going to have a lot of uh, people in the U.S. going out to California digging for gold, trying to find, you know, their fortune, things like this. All right. So what this does is the because of the Mexican-American War and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, this leads to what's known as the Compromise of 1850. And we, we deal with this in the class. The Compromise of 1850 dealt with five bills and it dealt with organizing the land that the U.S. got from Mexico and determining which territories would have uh, uh, slavery and which would not. But the fifth bill in the Compromise of 1850 was the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which intensified the abolitionist movement. And the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 went further than the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793, and it causes more runaway slaves to run into Canada. Okay. And this is going to also inch us closer to the U.S. Civil War taking place and inch us closer. Also, you're going to have armed conflict in the Kansas Territory, uh, which is known as Bleeding Kansas, around 1854-1855 after the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. So what we do is we go through and look at this history chronologically, year by year. So each class we go through and analyze approximately a 10, 15, 20 year period of history. Look at this history chronologically to see how these events lead to other events taking place. So what's the Kansas Nebraska Act of 1854? It's not something that you hear about every day. So it was passed over fierce opposition in Congress and signed into law in 1854. The Kansas Nebraska Act created the territories of Kansas and Nebraska and gave each uh, territory the right to decide whether or not to permit slavery. Uh, it was po called popular sovereignty. Um, when it uh, joined the Union, uh, uh, Stephen Douglas believed that popper, popular sovereignty and his idea was, uh, as his idea was known, would resolve the ongoing sectional debate between North and South over slavery's extension into the territories. OK, and because of this, this is going to infuriate a lot of abolitionists. OK, this left up the Kansas, Nebraska Act. Kansas Nebraska Act of 1854, which replaces the Missouri Compromise of 1820, okay? And the Missouri Compromise of 1820 dealt with organizing the land that the U.S. got from the Louisiana Purchase of 1803. And the Missouri Compromise of 1820 allowed Missouri to come into the Union as a slaveholding state and allowed Maine to come in as a free state because they kept a balance between the number of slaveholding states and the number of free states. So in 1820, you had 11 slaveholding states and 11 free states, okay? But what the Missouri Compromise also did was prohibit, this is, this is a law that passes Congress, a bill that passes Congress. It, it prohibits slavery in the remaining territories, okay? And in the Dred Scott decision, March 6, 1857, U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the Missouri Compromise of 1820 was unconstitutional because they said that the that the federal government had no authority to dictate to the people in those territories whether or not they could have slavery. And what this did was nullify Sam Blow's argument who we know as Dred Scott because his real name was Sam Blow, it nullified his argument because one of the territories that his slave owner took him into 
was the Wisconsin Territory. The Wisconsin Territory was free territory because of the Missouri Compromise of 1820. The U.S. Supreme Court rules the Missouri Compromise is unconstitutional, which nullifies his argument. The Missouri Compromise came into came into existence to, to organize the land that the U.S. got because of the Louisiana Purchase. And the uh, Missouri Compromise of 1850 comes about to organize the land that the U.S. gets because of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo of 1848 and the Mexican-American War of 1846 to 1848. Then we have this, the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. And this is over slavery as well. And then because of this, this causes the Republican Party to be founded in 1854 and founded by groups of abolitionists as a direct backlash to the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. So we go through and look at this history chronologically to see how these historical events and how these laws and policies lead to other events taking place, lead to the Civil War, Reconstruction, Jim Crow era, Great Migration, 1915, uh, uh, 1970, six million African Americans migrate from the South up north and out west, totally changes this country. World War I, World War II, civil rights movement, the Black Power movement. To better understand what happened to us, historical events don't happen in the vacuum. They are the culmination of a sequence of historical events that lead to other events taking place. And the people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. So to better understand how we to better understand where we need to go from here and what needs to happen, we have to understand what how we got to this place. What what happened? And most and most Americans, generally speaking, regardless of race, most Americans are ignorant of history. We talk about manifest destiny as well, 1845. In U.S. history, the supposed inevitability of the continued territorial expansion of the boundaries of the United States westward to the Pacific and beyond before the uh, American Civil War, the idea of manifest destiny was used to validate continental acquisitions in the Oregon County, Texas, New Mexico, and California. The purchase of Alaska and the, after the Civil War briefly revived the concept of manifest destiny, but it, uh, but it most evidently became a renewed force in U.S. foreign policy in the 1890s when the country went to war with Spain, annexed Hawaii, and laid plans for the, um, and laid plans for the uh, Isthmian uh, uh, Canal across Central America. Britannica.com has a good piece on Manifest Destiny. Uh, so we get into Manifest Destiny and this ideology and John L. Sullivan uh, who coined the term manifest destiny as well. So we look at the uh, Reconstruction era, 1865, 1877, uh, 40 acres and a mule, special field order number 15, uh, which is uh, issued by uh, uh, General uh, William T. Uh, Sherman and is going to be revoked by President Johnson after Lincoln's assassinated April 4th. Lincoln shot April 4th, 1865, and he dies April 15th, 1865. He dies the next morning about 7.22 a.m. So we look at what 40 Acres and the Mule was, okay, and what it wasn't. It didn't. It, it, it only applied to uh, uh, coastal land in South Carolina, uh, Georgia, and Florida. It didn't apply to all of the South. It only applied to coastal land in South Carolina, Florida, and Georgia. And uh, up to 40-acre uh, plots were divided by about uh, 40,000 uh, African Americans. We look at uh, Juneteenth as well, June 19th, 1865, General Gordon Granger goes into uh, Galveston, Texas, and he goes throughout Texas delivering the news that the Civil War was over, okay? The Emancipation Proclamation did not end the Civil War, did not free the slaves. Is 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 the, uh, he, he's announcing that the Civil War is over, but the 13th Amendment has not been ratified yet. 13th Amendment, isn't ratified till December 6, 1865, when Georgia ratifies the 13th Amendment, because for an amendment to the U.S. Constitution to become law, it has to pass both the House and the Senate by two thirds majority vote. Then it has to be uh, voted on by the state legislatures and it has to pass. Uh, uh, it has to pass three quarters of the state legislatures by two third majority vote. 
So the 13th Amendment what didn't become law until December 6, 1865, when Georgia voted on, the Georgia State House voted on the 13th Amendment. That's what is going to end slavery. But uh, when we talk about Juneteenth, we have to uh, really understand that history, okay? Because a lot of people uh, misunderstand and think the, uh, the, think the African slaves were freed because of the Emancipation Proclamation. No, this is why it's important to read these documents. Because when you actually read the Emancipation Proclamation, it clearly tells you that the that the slaves in the states of rebellion and territories of rebellion are free, but the slaves in the border states like Missouri, Maryland, Kentucky, and Delaware, they're still slaves. It tells you this in the document. And the U.S. had no authority, the Union had no authority to dictate to the Confederacy what they could do because the Confederacy had separated from the Union, set up their own constitution, set up their own monetary system, so you have no control. You can't dictate to them what to do. All right. How's everybody doing? How y'all like this type of information? So we deal with the 13th Amendment, 14th Amendment, 15th Amendment to better understand that. We talk about people like Sarah Rector, who became the richest Afro-American girl in the world in the early 1900s when oil was discovered on land that she and her family got uh, because of the Black Freedmen Indian Treaties of 1866 and the Dawes Allotment Act of 1887. OK, and uh, she was of uh, uh, her parents were of um, enslaved Creek Indian ancestry. We know the Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, Cherokee and Seminole Indians all owned uh, African slaves. Now, I'm not saying all 566 federally recognized tribal nations did, but these th these large nations did own um, um, African slaves as well. And when the Civil War took place, they all fought on behalf of the South to maintain slavery also. Okay, so we talk about things like the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871, uh, the uh, Freedmen's Bureau of 1865, and the Freedmen's Bank as well, and the collapse of the Freedmen's Bank. We deal with different massacres and understand this, uh, the Colfax Massacre um, uh, as well of 1873. But look at these different things. You follow Alabama Massacre 1874, uh, initiated by the White League, and we see this domestic terrorism this domestic terrorism that's inflicted upon African Americans to intimidate us and keep us away from the voting polls also, okay, to terrorize us, which is, which is, this is a continuation, January 6th insurrection is a continuation of this political violence that we saw during uh, the, uh, toward the end of the Reconstruction era, especially, but then during the Jim Crow era, it's going to intensify. Uh, how many people are familiar with the uh, Yafala, Alabama uh, uh, massacre of uh, November 3rd, 1874. This is around this is uh, around elections and voting. On November 3rd, 1874, a deadly uh, deadly election riots took place in Barber County, Alabama. The White League, which is another domestic terrorist organization, the White League, which was a paramilitary group affiliated with the Democratic Party at the time in 1874. This is before the party realignment takes place that starts in 1928 with the Lily White movement in 1928 when uh, Republicans appeal to Democrat, Demo uh, segregationist Democrats in five former Confederate states to get them to vote for uh, the Republican candidate for president, Herbert Hoover, and the Republicans start to ignore the needs and concerns of African Americans and, and ignore the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, and they start pushing African Americans out of the Republican Party. And we start slowly going over to the Democratic Party because we saw them as being more receptive to our issues, especially President Roosevelt and his wife, Eleanor Roosevelt. We start slowly going over to the Democratic Party. By 1960, two thirds of African-Americans had already switched over to the Democratic Party. We didn't switch over because of the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65. You got to go 40 years before that and go back to the Lily White movement of 1928 and, 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 and Herbert Hoover and look at what's taking place in the 1920s. So the White League, a paramilitary group affiliated with the Democratic Party attacked African-American voters at the polls in Yafala and Spring Hill. Seven African-Americans were killed and 70 others wounded. More than 1,000 African-Americans were driven away from the polls due to the violence of the, uh, due to the violence of the whites, uh, of white supremacy, of this white supremacist group, okay? So, what took place January 6th is a continuation of this of this political violence 
we deal with things like the Vicksburg Massacre of 1874, et cetera. And then we go through and, and look at how these rights of African Americans were being reversed during this Jim Crow era. Now, this is before Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, which was Homer Plessy. Uh, it, was, it was the case of Homer Plessy in 1892. Homer Plessy was on a railroad car, a, segre, a, a railroad car in Louisiana, and refused to go to the colored section. Now he was seven eighth, seven eighths white. He described himself as seven eighths uh, white or European and one eighth African. Okay, and if 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 he had not told the train conductor uh, his ethnicity. Okay, he could have passed because he looked white. We see starting in 1881, we see the state legislatures start rewriting these laws. Okay, the, the, tr dealing with uh, transportation, public transportation. Tennessee in 1881 segregates railroad cars, uh, railroad cars, followed by Florida in 1887, Mississippi 1888. Texas 1889, Louisiana 1890. It's going to be the law in 1890 that Homer Plessy challenges in 1892 that leads to Plessy versus Ferguson, U.S. Supreme Court case 1896. Alabama, Kentucky, Arkansas, and Georgia 1891. South Carolina 1898. North Carolina 1899. Georgia 1900. Maryland 1904. Oklahoma 1907. When o Oklahoma comes into the Union in 1907, if you've heard of Bass Reeves, the legendary African-American lawman that is believed the Lone Ranger is based upon, Bass Reeves was a lawman in Oklahoma. He had to retire when Oklahoma became a state in the Union in 1907 because Oklahoma quickly adopted segregation laws and it became illegal for him to be, be a lawman. So he had to retire. Okay, uh, we deal with things like the Mississippi State Convention. 1890, where Judge Solomon Saladin Calhoun, who was a judge that presided over the Mississippi State Convention, he said, we came here to exclude the Negro. And they, and they passed poll taxes and literacy tests. They wrote that into the Mississippi State Constitution to suppress the African-American vote in a state where African-Americans were the majority of the population and the majority of the voters. And then this is going to be copied by other Southern states as well. Okay, this became known as the Mississippi Plan and then this is going to be adopted by South Carolina and, and uh, uh, Florida and Georgia. Now, 1889, Florida has the first poll taxes. 1889, we deal with what the, we deal with the all white primaries, like the all white primaries in Texas, which which was a, a way to exclude us from voting as well. And we see that uh, the U.S. Supreme Court in Smith versus All Right, 1944 U.S. Supreme Court case, uh, where that was argued by Thurgood Marshall. We see that the U.S. Supreme Court is going to rule that the all-white primaries are unconstitutional. It's 1944. Okay, so we talk about people like uh, Ida B. Wells. We deal with the uh, World War One, uh, World War Two, Great Migration, six million African Americans migrating from the South up north and out west. Totally changes this country. This is going to lead to racial conflicts as well. And after World War Two ends, then we're going to see the building really of the suburbs. OK, and African-Americans being locked out of uh, moving to the suburbs because of redlining and being discriminated against. And when it comes to taking advantage of the uh, GI Bill and the benefits that we earned in the GI Bill also. So we go through the uh, uh, World War One, World War Two, civil rights movement, uh, black power movement. OK, and go through this history to understand, get a better understanding of what happened to us during these periods of time. What were the laws and policies put in place? We look at things like the um, Kerner Commission report, which is largely ignored by President Johnson, but needs to be implemented right now. The Kerner Commission report. OK, how's everybody doing? How you all like this type of information? So this is a 10 week online class that I teach on Sundays called From the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power 1865 to 1968. Give us a thumbs up or a heart or something like that if you like this information. Have you learned anything today so far? I know some people who uh, are taking this class and have taken my classes in the past. This may be information you already know. You can register for this class at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And uh, 
also and also um, we'll post a link here as well so I teach this class on Sundays 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, the class is on sale eighty dollars regularly one hundred thirty dollars okay we do the sessions live all the sessions are archived and recorded you can go back and watch it anytime um, and then we teach uh, on Saturday ancient Kemet the Moors and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade what they didn't teach you in school we had a great class this weekend uh, as soon as you register for this class, this is on sale eighty dollars. Also, regular one hundred thirty dollars. Do this two p.m. to four p.m. on Saturdays. As soon as you register, you can watch the uh, class we just did. Uh, we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch them anytime. A year from now, if you want to go back and watch everything, just relive everything. You can do that. You can watch on demand. Okay. We have a bundle pack uh, right now. For you can get both classes. For $120. Now you're also going to get some bonus lectures from me. So the Michael M. Hotep 15 uh, lecture bundle pack that we have in DVD format. If you want to order it in DVD format, it's on sale $100. You can order it on sale in DVD format, but you're going to get these 15 lectures also uh, included in uh, understanding the transatlantic slave trade. It's going to be in digital format. Okay, so you, you'll get that as well as a bonus. But um, we have the bundle pack on sale $120. So you can register for that. If you've taken any of my classes uh, in the past, and I've been teaching these classes since uh, 2017, email me at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com uh, if you want a 50% discount. Okay, email me at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com uh, if you want a 50% discount. All right, okay, so we'll post this here. Okay, so we got that. And uh, here's the link to uh, register for uh, the class also here. Um, here's the link uh, to register for the class from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power, 1865 to 1968. All right. Um, be sure to listen to my radio show Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to midnight Eastern Standard Time. The African History Network show. Um, I'm on 9, 10 a.m. the Superstation, WFDF, and we're on six days a week. Uh, we have the information at our website. Uh, from I'm on Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to midnight, and Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the African History Network show. Here I am in the studio. Um, we broadcast on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, and my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P, when I'm on live. Click here to listen to audio podcasts, download the iHeartRadio app, search for the African History Network show, because uh, my audio podcasts are on 10 different audio podcast platforms also. And you can listen to 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF live through the iHeartRadio app as well. And if you want to support the African History Network, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Okay, so... Um, this helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, pay some of the bills, etc. And this is our official Cash App account, dollar sign, the AHN Show, S-H-O-W. When you go to it, it says Michael and shows my picture there. These other ones here are fake African History Network Cash App accounts. I did not set those up, but we have our link here also. Okay, look, we have to get out of here. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, share this broadcast, register for the class, follow us on our social media platforms. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you next time. Peace. What does self care mean to you? To us, it's an opportunity to reconnect with nature, a chance to create something remarkable. At Sage and Elm Apothecary, our handcrafted skin care and household products immerse you in Earth's sweetest nectar, connecting you to nature in a way you never imagined. See for yourself and visit us at sageandelmapothecary.com. iRedify is a Black-owned digital platform that showcases Black and Brown cultures and people. The books on the platform are written by African-American authors 
Afro-Caribbean authors, African authors, and so much more. Kids 14 and under can read ebooks, listen to audiobooks, and complete learning activities. Kids can even write in the books digitally. Get unlimited access to everything on the platform for only $8.99 a month at iredify.com. Sign up for your membership today. Mental health and well-being have long been a taboo subject in the so-called African-American community. So I enlisted the help of mental health experts, thought leaders, and activists to help kill the ghost of Willie Lynch and heal from post-traumatic slave syndrome. We experience trauma a lot of times um, on a subconscious level. So sometimes something happens to us and we know that it's traumatizing, but we don't really recognize the extent of the trauma. Come and travel with me to a time long ago and place far away. You will experience high adventure and excitement. You are fighting alongside an ancient army in fierce battle. Feel the exhilaration of struggle and final conquest. My name is Maninkare and I am both a prince and a priest in one of the most advanced civilizations humans have ever produced. I want you to ride with me in my chariot as I slay the barbarians who have come to invade my land. I invite you to sit at the conference table with the great Pharaoh Taharqa and his ministers as they plan intrigue and use subterfuge to outmaneuver and defeat the enemy. Come back with me to the land of your ancestors, to the beautiful land of Kemet. So open the pages of this book and begin the adventure. Find out what happens in the book Maninkare Battles the Assyrians in the Nile Valley from author Makari Jones. Get your copy today at Amazon.com. STEM Forward, helping our community find their place in the emerging fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Join us for our monthly live stream on our website, stemforwardedu.org. Watch, subscribe, share. Also join our mailing list to stay up to date with STEM resources and opportunities. STEM Forward, the future is now. Watch, subscribe, share. Follow the story Skeeter Hawk as attorney Ben Brooks rediscovers his Gullah Geechee heritage and finds romance along the Gullah Trail and the Sea Islands. Jilted by his fiance who refused to marry him, Ben Brooks goes back home to Gullah country. There, the Gullah people come to call him Skeeter Hawk. While rediscovering his heritage, Skeeter Hawk unravels dark family secrets. A beautiful childhood friend, Fulla, becomes his guide as they travel the Gullah Trail from North Carolina to the Sea Islands in South Carolina in search of more answers. Ben Brooks falls in love with her and becomes torn between her and his former fiance who wants to rekindle their romance. He also deals with a premonition that one of his enemies is pursuing him, providing a backdrop for mystery, romance, intrigue, and suspense in this page-turning novel called Skeeter Hawk from author Sabby Stone. Order your copy today at SabbyStone.com. That's S-A-B-Y, Sabby Stone.